In this episode of Masonic Improvement, we talk about lodges merging, young men in Freemasonry, how to attract them, as well as creating an online presence. We talk about the investigation process at Hillcrest Masonic Lodge, the importance of guarding the West Gate, the importance of having nice buildings, dress codes, running your lodge like a business, endowments, and hashtag no skulls and Freemasonry. This is Masonic Improvement, and I am your host, Justin Jones. Thank you for joining. Before I get into the interview, I'm happy to give my usual shout out to Brother Francisco Garcia, who, who is a past master of Hidalgo Masonic Lodge, number 1036 here in Texas. He's responsible for my intro music. I'm going to include links to his SoundCloud and YouTube channel below. Check him out. He has some great content. Please show him your support. And one last little piece of housekeeping. The thoughts and views being expressed by myself, as well as those expressed by the brother that I've invited to this conversation, do not reflect those of any lodge or grand lodge. They are strictly our own opinions. That said, let me introduce you to brother Stephen Berryman. Stephen Berryman, how are you today, sir? Doing well. How about yourself, my brother? I am fantastic. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come talk with me today. Of course. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your Masonic background? My Masonic background, I was raised about eight and a half years ago at uh, Lebanon Lodge 837 here in Frisco, Texas. Um, I was initiated about a, a little bit less than a year prior to that. Um, immediately jumped in the chairs. I was a uh, steward for two years did a whole lot of cooking. We ate almost every single week. So um, <laughs> I, I ended up cooking for almost a hundred weeks out of that two-year stretch. Um, lots of barbecue and home-style food. Um, from there, I jumped up to senior deacon, then did the junior warden, senior warden before um, moving over to Hillcrest. I, mm -hmm. I had a couple of visions that were a little different. Uh, different ideologies and um, Hillcrest was a better fit for me. I, I focused more on the esoteric, the symbolism, the history, the educational opportunities. And um, there, there were a bunch of people that were more focused on going out and raising money for the charitable acts. Instead of just teaching people to be charitable, they were focusing on the, you know, raising money specifically in the lodges name so they could give it away. And that wasn't what I was into. You're talking directly to my soul, Stephen. Yeah. So <laughs> from, from that, I did, uh, I, I filled in chairs at Hillcrest for my first year. Uh, you know, I, I visited for a couple of months, then petitioned for affiliation there. Um, started filling in chairs as they were needed for opening stated meetings, called meetings, degrees, whatever. And then um, the very first election, I was elected uh, junior warden senior warden now i'm the sitting worshipful master of hillcrest 1318 very cool and we'll talk a little bit more about that later because <laughs> i have seen some very interesting i haven't been to hillcrest right but I, oh come it's on my close it's on my well i am I'm, I'm much closer now than i was when we first met and so it's definitely on my to-do list tell me what got you into the fraternity originally uh, I found out right when my grandfather died when I was 18 that he was a Freemason. I'd always been interested in the history, the Knights Templar, the, uh, the history of the Founding Fathers, things along those lines. They, and the more I dug into it after he passed, the more that I found that the vast majority of our history as Americans is tied back to the fraternity. So mm -hmm. I just kept digging more and more and more. And um, once I moved up to Frisco in 2006, I started to get the feeling that I needed to do it. So I uh, waited a couple of years and I am here now. And we're glad to have you, brother. Appreciate that. So how did the reality of Freemasonry compare with your expectations? Initially, I, you know, I, I grew up in, in Pearland, Texas. I'd been in their lodge for voting for various uh, public events. Um, I'd gone to the one in Alvin for similar things. It never really appeared to be what I thought it was. You know, it, it wasn't like those great temples and stuff, the, the local lodges that I went to in the small towns. Um, 
the lodge that I joined here in Frisco, it was very much another small town lodge. It, um, it wasn't set up like the temple. It didn't have, you know, the marble everywhere. Um, it, it, it just didn't have the, the feel that I thought that it would have. The, the brethren, the brethren were very nice, uh, <laughs> loving, all about the work. But um, it, to me, that you say regality, that was missing. That, that was the one part that I was missing uh, mm -hmm. in the very beginning. It, it didn't look the way that I thought it would. It didn't look like, you know, National Treasure or um, Da Vinci Code type things. It was, um, it, it was more small town. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think that lodges could do a little bit more um, repairs to their facilities to make it where um, and, and also merge with other lodges, consolidate, take, take care of the necessary steps to make it where they actually have the funds to build facilities that um, mimic those that we're seeing online, See, mimic the ones that we're seeing in the movies um, in the East Coast. You know, you go, you go to the lodges in Pennsylvania, they're very ornate with the uh, woodwork on the walls and what have you. That's mm -hmm. the young people that are joining today, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the you know the type of lodges that the founders went to yeah so i remember i went to north carolina what was the name of that wilmington i think is that i think is that town north carolina i think it i think it is but um we were walking down the old downtown and i was a pretty new mason at the time and i noticed as we passed a building there was a uh, a nice entryway with a with a kind of recessed door, and I was just looking because there was a very intricate um, archway, really, that led to this door, and I was admiring the, the really the craftsmanship. But I got to looking much more closely, and it was uh, the entry to the Masonic Lodge, and it was like this archway with this really intricate symbolism and everything. I point this out because this was an old lodge in that town. Mm -hmm. And even here in Texas, even in the small towns, we often see the remnants or, or the, the building itself that used to be the Masonic Lodge. And granted, it might have been on the second story, but it was a nice building. It was, it exactly. was something that, that looked like the brothers put money into it. They oh, yeah. cared about it. And often what happens is when you find where the actual lodge is currently, it's, it's nowhere near, it's much like what you're saying, it's nowhere near the expectations that are set when you look at historically where we used to meet. Yes. What are this, so going right off of that, <laughs> what, are the, what are the strengths and weaknesses of our fraternity? Strengths, I, I think that the brethren themselves are the strength, the, um, those that are really big into education, historical aspect, Robert Marshall, uh, Dave McCam, Ruben Bazan, um, those that focus on the history of our fraternity, on the um, history of the symbolism, all of the, um, all of the historical aspects, the things that made fraternity, the fraternity great to begin with, um, that, the, those that know how to lead, those that know how to um, motivate others, those are things that I consider to be strengths of our fraternity. Mm -hmm. the, um, the ability to move on, move, uh, move forward, it, it come up with initiatives that are actually going to strengthen the fraternity over time. You might lose a couple of members in the very beginning just because it's different. It wasn't done that way in my year, uh, you know, the grumpy past master type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, it's going to strengthen the fraternity as a whole. Absolutely. It seems before we get into the, the weakness, you know, you, you talk about making decisions that you might lose a few brothers here and there. Do you have anything off the top of your head? Is there anything that comes to mind when, when you when you talk about like if you if you had a magic wand and you could change anything about the fraternity? I, I think some of the things that can be improved upon are the judgmental attitudes of lots of the brethren, those that have not cracked a book in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, 
never really delved into the history of the fraternity, didn't get past the catechism, the, the ritual, as mm -hmm. it may be, didn't look into what the ritual actually meant, but uh, have a preconceived notion about what they think it should be. So um, they're judgmental about what, where the fraternity should be and what it should do, uh, should it, what it should do based on, you know, how their grandfather ran the lodge or how their, their predecessors ran it, how they were taught instead of what they actually learned and researched. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily correct, not necessarily wrong, but, you know, they, if they haven't cracked the law book, the monitor, or any other supplemental books, um, it's hard to truly know what the fraternity is about and what it's good at and how it should be run. Yeah. Just a thought. When you, when you mentioned risk tolerance, I'm sorry, you didn't mention risk tolerance, but you mentioned risk itself. And it just got me thinking, you know, as you're, as you're making your point as a whole, the fraternity doesn't really have any risk tolerance. And that's from a, from a, like a big perspective, but also from a smaller large perspective. Um, for example, we, brought up dues last December in my lodge and zero risk tolerance. Of course, because the big concern is you're always going to run some people off. And of course we know, we know that's generally that's, that's a garbage argument, but you always, the, the, the argument that you always get from that one is the fixed income. And the, to me, you know, I'll, I'll get up on my little soapbox right now. If you are not on a commission based income structure, you are on a fixed income. I, I've collected salary for the last 20 years, whatever. That's a fixed income. It's not changing from month to month. Yeah. Unless I, unless I do something with my side gig, I'm not making any more money. Yeah. So, you know, it, it comes down to a planning and prioritization. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you don't plan for the increase, if you don't plan for the, or, or prioritize lodge as a whole, then um, you're not going to be able to come up with the money. Absolutely. So we're, we're treading, is. we're treading a fine line right now because I had a whole, a whole section where I wanted to talk about dues. So let's, well, <laughs> I'm good with that. Let's, let's not, let's not break up our, our, our question too much. Cause I want to jump back to dues, but let's, let's talk about the weaknesses of our fraternity. Weaknesses, uh, strong-willed people. Um, those that are title seekers, um, Refusing to change, change, change to, seems to be taboo. Mm -hmm. That we we can't modernize, we can't come up with a different method to do something because that wasn't the way that it was done previously. Um, there are all kinds of ways to do everything. There, there are ways that we can modernize absolutely anything at Grand Lodge and the functionality of the local lodges. You know the the way that we bring finances in, the way that we run the lodge, run it like a business. We can make it more efficient. We can streamline the processes. Um, but there's, there's so much kickback just because it's uncomfortable for people that don't do it for a living or haven't thought about that in, haven't thought of lodge in a business type sense. So yes. um, that, that's, what, that's what I see to be one of the weaknesses as a whole with the fraternity. And um, that, that's global. I've, I've, I've talked to brothers all around the world, all over mm -hmm. the United States. Um, and, and that seems to be pretty universal that you, you get kickback from people that just don't understand what we're trying to do, even if we explain it. They just kind of close their, um, close their mind, close their ears, stick their fingers in their ears and go la la la. You know, it, yeah. they just don't want to hear it. Absolutely. So what's interesting about that to kind of summarize that, that last question, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses? Really, you're saying people, the members themselves are both the strengths and the weaknesses. Very much we're, so. we're our own, we're our own worst enemy and our own, yes. our own best friend at the same time. Yes, very much so. But I think that's going to tie into another question later on about a, about a certain gate, but we'll get to oh, that in a little bit. I'm good with that gate. <laughs> Going back to our weaknesses, how can we correct them? I think possibly hosting some um, called meetings that would 
discuss the modernization of the fraternity might be helpful, as well as bringing in subject matter experts from around the district, say at the NWSA level, to uh, come up with some processes that would help the lodges that are in distress or in need move forward with some of the initiatives. I see. I like that. <laughs> education, right? Exactly. It's all about education. Where do you see our current course taking the fraternity in the next 10, 20, or 30 years? 10, 20, 30 years. Um, what I've been seeing lately is an influx of younger men. So um, getting lots of the millennials and even the Gen Z is coming in. They're, they're interested in the fraternity. They're interested in the history. They're wanting to make a difference in society, both um, through the charitable aspects and also um, just being part of society, um, influencing. And I, I see them taking hold of our fraternity and modernizing it even beyond what we're doing. So um, making it more user-friendly, maybe even a little bit more visible, not, yeah. not the ritual and what have you, but just make the fraternity as a whole more visible to society, you know, not hide it in the corners, not make people search for the little square encompasses on the side of the building, but make mm -hmm. it where we are the uh, focus of the town square like we used to be. I love it. Speaking of young men, it is often said that young men are not attracted to our fraternity and like you i have seen the opposite of that uh -huh. what do you say to people that would that would dismiss youth for whatever reason what are they not offering that they should be what what is it that they're not bringing to the table with freemasonry that is driving those men away we're they, we're in the middle of dallas i can't say that we live in a uh, young man's area we're we're in a really affluent neighborhood, but there aren't a lot of young people there. You've got to drive a pretty good distance to get to the areas where the young people are going to hang out. And we have a large group of young men that have been joining over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, in the last couple of months, we've, I think, initiated five new men and none of them's over 32. Wow. So, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're growing in the young guys. It's, it, it can be done. You just have to offer something that they want. They don't want, you know, green bean dinners. They don't want, um, you know, spaghetti socials. They don't want the pancake breakfast as a fundraiser. They want to do real work. Mm -hmm. They want to be, um, they want to be doing the studying. They want to uh, travel around the world, visit other lodges. They want to see the things that are, truly Freemasonry. Yes. So in regards to attracting young men and like the numbers you gave us just a minute ago, is that the norm in the area? There are a couple of other lodges within the 14th district that are also doing, I, I think similar numbers to what my lodge is doing. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily all the time, but th there are some that are growing you know, others just aren't marketing themselves as uh, efficiently as we do. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it is probably to their detriment. Yeah. You know, if, if you don't have a good um, website presence, as well as Facebook presence, it, if you aren't showing up in the search engines, you're just not going to attract the younger men. You just, you really don't exist. If you don't you show don't. up online, if you don't have you some don't. kind of footprint. And if you, if you create a page and ignore it and don't respond to the emails, if you um, don't respond to the messages that come into the Facebook page for your lodge, you're, you're throwing those numbers away because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're going to get irritated and either look at a different lodge or just write the fraternity off as a whole. Yeah. We had a brother at my lodge. He just turn in his master's, you know, he got, came in before the, you know, the virus of unspecified origin that we won't go into on this. So YouTube didn't censor me, but um, he reached out to every lodge in our district and he joined my lodge because it's the only one that reached back to him. 
And that's I've sad. Heard, I've heard of those situations. Yeah. And um, I am the point of contact for our email. So anybody that reaches out through our webpage, it comes directly to my email. And I, I, I work from home. So I've got six screens in front of me at all times. Uh, one of them has my Gmail up on it all the time. So I see those emails hit and I can almost immediately get back with them, respond to them. Um, generally, I start off with asking them what interested them in the fraternity to begin with, as well as give a, a brief history of who they are and what they're about. That mm -hmm. gives me a little bit of an insight into what they're looking for, if our lodge is going to be a good fit for them, or if they're looking for something completely out of the norm that our lodge doesn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, it also lets me know if they're just seeking grandeur or um, social accolades or something, you know, to become a better realtor or whatever, yeah. you know, you use our fraternity as a springboard. That's not something that we're willing to play with, but yeah. um, it lets us vet the individuals the first round. I, I throw it back at them a few times, get, get as thorough information as I can possibly get from them. Mm -hmm. And then that lets me lead them into uh, coming out to one of our socials and so our you're, social, oh, go ahead you're already before you even meet the petitioner you're describing a more detailed investigation process than 99.9 percent .9 of Masonic lodges in texas i won't allow them to meet with our people until i've already discussed things with them multiple times i don't i don't want us showing up to an event and having some crazy person there. I don't want anybody to think that they can just show up with a petition in hand and, and immediately get sign off. That's not the way we do it. We, uh -huh. you know, you, you mentioned earlier, guarding the gate, guarding the West gate. Yeah. That is, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. We're trying to make sure that we don't get crazy or inappropriate people into our fraternity. We're trying to maintain uh, a level of decorum. We're trying to maintain the, uh, the, greatness that our craft has been for 300 years mm -hmm. um, and you know a little vetting has to be done yeah and yeah so let's look at the bigger picture then because we're already we're already into that conversation about the west gate let's let's take a broader perspective on that you know you mentioned you'll keep you know the, the, the crazies out basically which yeah totally agree but really aside from that what is what is the purpose of of the vetting process um not only the purpose of it but do you think it's being implemented well across the state from some of the conversations i've had online <laughs> both with those that have already become masons and uh those that are in lodges that aren't following the processes similar to what we're doing no i don't think we're guarding the westgate well i see we're uh we're, we're letting in people that have no purpose of or no no right to be a brother they they're they're doing it specifically so they can have a dues paying member on their role i see um that's uh, I chalk that up to another one of the weaknesses in the fraternity those that would rather do a degree and have a dues paying member than have a mason do you think that's going to have repercussions in the long term yes it uh it has a negative uh societal repercussion on us mm -hmm. if those people are going around telling others in society that they're masons and they are not a good person if they are um, not representing us in the best light then yeah that's a negative social repercussion mm -hmm. i just as we talk about the west gate you know because because worst case scenario and it seems unlikely until you actually read about it happening but worst case scenario is you let someone into the fraternity that that probably shouldn't be a mason and once they receive that master's degree, they're capable of leading a lodge. They're capable of going to the Grand East at some point. Mm -hmm. And while none of these none of these stories have come out of Texas, about once a year you do hear horror stories from other parts of the country, and some Grand Master just doing something completely off the wall. And every time I see that, and, and it's like clockwork, once a year you see something like that. At but every time I see, year. at least, but every time I see that, I can't help but think that guy was petitioning a lodge at one point, and we failed. 
<laughs> yeah. We dropped the ball big time. Yeah. Well, when, when the entire investigation process is scripted and people are not taught to break out of the script and try to delve deeper into who these people are, who their families are, what their families are involved in. And if their family knows that they're going to be away from home X amount of time, mm -hmm. you're doing a disservice to that brother. You're doing a disservice to the fraternity and you're not finding out the information that you need to find out to make sure that that's going to be a valuable asset to the craft. Did Hillcrest already have a pretty rigorous investigation process before you yes. kind of, they did. Okay. Yes. Kyle Walquist and um, some of the other past masters implemented a very good process. And um, I believe they had already implemented the six month wait period from the time that you start showing up at our socials to the time mm -hmm. that you can even think about turning a petition in. I see. And uh, that gives us a chance to meet the person off site, um, get to know them a little bit, let them ask questions about the fraternity, let us ask questions about them. They can bounce things off of us in a yeah. in an environment that isn't as intimidating as a lodge. You know, we we made it a restaurant, a bar, something like that, where it's completely, you know, open for people to just talk and be normal. And huh. that that lets them lower their guard a little bit so that they can be their their selves instead of who they think that we want them to be. I'd like to unpack a few things because you mentioned a six month waiting period. You mentioned um, kind of almost acting like the gatekeeper, you know, when they're emailing, what does the process look like from start to finish from the time a, a man expresses interest to the time he's actually able to receive his internet apprentice degree? Start to finish, start. They show up on our webpage or our uh, Facebook page and send a message. There's the ability to email us. I uh, immediately respond to them, ask them for their details, their, their history, their uh, what prompted their interest, their familial history to, to find out if they actually had family members that were Masons. Um, go back and forth with them a few times to get the appropriate answers. Hope, hope they're going to expand upon it and give us something that's thorough so that I don't have to keep nitpicking to try to get uh, something that is actually thorough. Um, from there, I will, once I'm confident they're not going to show up with a gun at one of our events and shoot us all, we'll, uh, we'll invite them to one of the socials. Um, we'll get a good feel on who they are, what they are. Um, after the social's over, I'll call all of the brothers that were present and get a feeling for each one of the inquirers that have shown up to the event. Um, from that point, we'll either invite them to the next one or um, tell them that they might want to look elsewhere. And we'll do that for a few months until we're comfortable with them. And then at that point, we let them uh, present us with a petition. And I see. If, if people have actually talked to them, been social with them and are comfortable, you know, signing for them, you're effectively saying, you think this person's going to be a good Mason, you are comfortable with what you've discussed with them, then they'll sign the form and we'll bring it before the lodge of the next stated meeting. Okay. I love it. That, that also gives people that are actually going to do the investigation a little bit more peace of mind that they've been met with multiple times and that they, um, those that have already signed the petition are comfortable with them. It's not like they showed up at dinner and just got a, sign, a signature on a petition and, you know, that was the first time they were ever met. Mm -hmm. So uh, our, doing our due diligence. Exactly. Our investigators can then branch out a little bit more deeply in, in the investigation process. I think it's very interesting that the lodges that seem to be thriving the most, granted there's exceptions, but the lodges that seem to be doing really well are implementing more stringent uh, procedures for, for entry into the lodge. And yet when you, when you start talking about implementing these things openly you get a lot of pushback oh you will and as you know because we, we we had talked about it i think it was last year i think it was oh, when so, i yeah. made that article and there was quite a bit of pushback uh, and the article was about um, just implementing um better pro better procedures 
your investigation process. But, and so in most, in this and in most, what's the, what's the, what's really the word for this? It's, it's almost like, um, I hate to say new ideas because anything new is scary, right? And it's not necessarily a new idea. It's almost instilling exclusivity into the fraternity that it used to be. Yeah. You know, they, you you didn't accept every person off the street. We never meant for that to happen. So that boom that happened in the twenties and thirties, that was, that wasn't the way that Freemasonry was ever designed to be. It wasn't meant to have a lodge in every single town. Yeah. It was, it was meant to be an exclusive fraternity craft club call it whatever you want. It, it wasn't meant for the layman. It was meant for those who were actually quality. And so many members want it to be an everyman club. Yes. You know, it's, and it, historically it wasn't, it's like you're saying, no. it's, it's a pretty recent innovation. My granddad, and I've, I've told this story before, so you may have heard it, but my granddad petitioned my local lodge when he was really young. And um, they, they had a policy back then, and this was not unheard of, but by today's standards, it'd be almost barbaric. But the policy at the time was the first time you petitioned, you got blackballed regardless of, of who you are, what, you know, what you're known. And I don't necessarily agree with, with that practice, but I agree with the mentality because the idea was if someone really wanted to join if it wasn't just a passing interest they'd come back and, and repetition but this idea of, of, of being exclusive is is something that's been around for for quite a while and that's really what happened that's that's what that did was it made it an exclusive organization because many people petitioned few got in you, you I, mentioned you mentioned blackballing How many people in our 67,000-ish Master Masons, how many of them do you think have ever seen a black ball actually hit and prevent a person from becoming a member? It's, it's, we're talking probably like decimal point percentage. I've seen, that's not the way it should happen. Absolutely. I agree. I've seen, I've seen black balls, but never enough to, to, have a any kind of impact on the vote you know and you're right it it should it should be a lot more common if i just know from my personal experience i have allowed people into the fraternity that i was on the fence about you know i i i wanted to like the guy but i didn't know if he'd be good for the fraternity and it turns out i should have went with my gut yeah our guts and, tell us something. But it's 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 hard to listen to your gut sometimes, you know. But it's my, my point is that it, it should be more common. We we if if there's doubt, keep them out. <laughs> yeah. Because because they can always repetition. But it's after a certain period of time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's better but safe gonna, than it's better safe than sorry though, isn't it? We want to be different than other parts of society. I want to be comfortable with any man in my fraternity coming into my house with me having a stack of hundreds on the counter, my wife and daughter. Mm -hmm. I want to know that nothing's going to happen to any of them. And if you're, if people are not guarding the West gate and are letting people in and letting them be brothers, Mm -hmm. that's not peace of mind for me. Cause that obligation means a lot. Or it should to, we're, we're really obligating ourselves to one another. And in my mind, if you're calling a man brother, that's family. Yeah, they're family. And the beauty about this is <laughs> honestly, we all have people in our family that if we could have the choice of saying, hey, you're family, hey, you're not, they probably wouldn't be family, right? Mm-hmm. We have that opportunity in the fraternity. We, we can pick who our, who our brothers are. But as it is, it's come as you are. Yeah. So, I uh, I agree wholeheartedly with what you are doing as far as your as far as your investigation process, and I've I've 
talk to brothers from other lodges that are doing very similar processes and it's, it's very successful from what I'm, it is. What I'm hearing from, I'm hearing good things from everybody that's doing this stuff, kind of thing. When, when you start doing the process, it, it might seem a little harsh. It might seem um, counterproductive because you're, you're going to push people away. You're going to make it where you aren't accepting people that would have been accepted in the past. But to see the fraternity thrive, to see it be successful in the future, that's what we have to do. We have to make the dirty, ugly decisions and um, try to create quality. It's not about quantity. We, the quantity mindset was come about, you know, a hundred years ago, mm-hmm. and they never got away from it. You know, they they wanted to lower the amount that people were paying in dues and per capita, and raise the amount of people that paid and you know i i I made a post the other day that said i'd rather have four quarters than 100 pennies it's exactly true yeah we need people that are going to be those quarters yeah we don't we don't need the pennies exactly exactly i want to talk a little bit more about hillcrest lodge it's like i said it's on my it's on my list i want to go there i hear good things I see good things. I know, I mean, we've already talked about your investigation process, but I know you guys are doing things different. And I know that's the reason for your success. What does Hillcrest do different that other lodges are not? Hillcrest was a consolidation lodge. So they uh, consolidated with Love Field, who had the building in the quarry. Um, so it was actually the functional quarry where the uh, stone was pulled to make Love Field Airport. Um, they had the building. It was a nice size building in an ideal location. Um, they were having some membership issues where they weren't, where they were recycling past masters through the chairs, um, attendance issues. Hillcrest had a, a vibrant line. They had membership coming in, but they didn't have a building. They'd sold the building that was on Hillcrest in, in Dallas. So um, they came in with money, membership, and, and did the consolidation through the consolidation, they were able to revamp the inside of the building. You've got the wood walls, you've got the marble floors, you've got the uh, LED strip and laid in the floor and the ceiling. You've got the ceiling that's actually painted like the night sky. Um, Lots of beautiful aspects, um, beautiful decorations, beautiful uh, furniture, paintings on the walls, paintings in the ante room, um, things that actually increase the quality of the initiatic experience. So um, it's a building that people actually want to be in. People want to see it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when when you get the inquirers showing up to it to take the tour, they're all amazed because that looks like those East Coast lodges, the ones that were you know, t- uh, in, in pictures and in documentaries, that's that's what you expected Freemasonry to look like is that lodge building. Yeah. So they did it right. I've always said, if your city was to give like a tour of the of the community, if your lodge wouldn't make that list, you're doing something wrong. You know, your your lodge needs to. It needs to. It, your, your building itself is the first representation that people see. It's the first impression yeah. people get. And it needs to be a nice place. It needs, yes. to be, it needs to be clean and it needs to be organized. And it needs to instill, to be frank, it needs to instill a sense of awe when people go in. And I know, I know that's not always possible, you know, yeah. in smaller towns. I mean, you got to work with what you have. But they should be significant enough to the community that that there's something to talk about. If I'm giving a tour of that community, there's a reason. There needs to be a reason why we should stop in front of the lodge and, and, and give some kind of brief talk about it. And people need to be able to look at it and say, that looks nice. I like that place. Agreed. Agreed. It, it should be a destination. It should be some place that people go for their history. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you, you look at the walls of the vast majority of lodges in our state and you have the past masters. 
Who mm-hmm. were the past masters? They were the founders of the town. They were the movers, movers and shakers. They were the city councilmen. They were the businessmen. Um, there's there's history in those rooms. There's history in those minutes. There's planning that occurred in those rooms. Absolutely. So um, if, like you said, if they're not showing up on some list of places that the city needs to go look at, they should be. Let's talk a little bit and... <laughs> No. You, you may not you feel laugh. strong. <laughs> you laugh. Well, I'm just looking at the rest of my list and I'm trying to figure out what I want to cover next. But <laughs> but uh, I think they're all going to be good conversations. How do you feel about dress codes? For officers or people that just in general? Let's talk about in general. And if you have something in mind besides that, we can go into that. In general, my view, and this is only the view of the Yeti, is that dress with the level of respect that you would give a wedding or church lodge should be an important event for you it should be um something that you look forward to for the month that you you know stated meeting hey i'm going to stated meeting i'm excited about that i'm excited to see my brethren i i'm going to dress up for that event i'm i'm going to show the lodge the respect that that our craft deserves Uh It's it's not necessarily, you know, to be exclusive or um, what what is it? What what are we always called? Uh, Elitist. Elitist. There's the word. Um, It's not about that. It's, it's not about any of those things. It's, it's about showing the craft, the respect that it deserves. Our craft has been around for over 300 years. Uh It has, any picture you see of our founding fathers in regalia, what are they wearing? They're definitely suited up, but or whatever is appropriate for the time. Lots of them worked in manual labor. Ben Franklin was a printer, so he would he was always around ink and all the other stuff, but he mm-hmm. didn't show up in you know ink covered clothes. He he went home and changed for those events. Yes, that's or or brought a change of clothes whenever he went to lodge. That's that's how it happens, and you know it's it's not about going out and buying a thousand or two thousand dollar suit. Most of the suits in my closet are between forty and seventy bucks. I I, I found a good place in Canada, and I I buy them regularly because <laughs> you know they fit, and and all I have to do is get the pants hemmed. But I, I'm a fan of dressing for my brethren. It's mm-hmm. it's. It, it's showing them and the lodge as a whole the level of respect that I think it deserves uh, for degrees. Uh, I, I also think that degrees should be uh, given that same level of decorum. So stated meetings and degrees should be, I, in the Yeti's opinion, it should be a, a, an event to dress up for, mm-hmm. uh, as well as any grand lodge event. Um, if, if you're just doing a called meeting for a proficiency or something, dress down. Don't, don't go out of your way for it. But, um, you know, the, the big events, they, they, they should be given that level of respect. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I just got done uh, recording a wrap-up for another interview, and I was, I was talking about making events special, and particularly degrees, right? Because you're only going to get one of each degree your entire life. Mm-hmm. That's you might go to hundreds of others, you know, you'll, you'll see them, you might practice them, you might even can, can, uh, confer them at some point, but you only get one EA, one fellow craft, one master mason. And those are supposed to be life-changing events. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm going to participate in a degree, I'm going to do everything I can to make it the most significant for you. And you're going to be, you can be rest assured I'm going to dress nice because if, if I dress like it's important, that conveys to you that it's important. If everyone shows up in shorts and flip flops, making fart jokes, yeah. you know, then then that doesn't really strike as anyone as important. It's just it's just another night for those guys. It's expected in my lodge that if you show up for a degree, that you are suit and tie. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of years back, we actually did a kilted master masons degree. Oh, cool. So yeah, all, all the brethren that participated uh, wore kilts with the vest and um, 
coats and it was it was quite an event i i, I loved that one just because mm-hmm. it was a little bit different it wasn't it wasn't the norm it wasn't you know a themed event it wasn't you know wearing the period garb from king solomon but yeah it, it was it, it was something that was a little different i i think a lot of the objections to I'm not even gonna say dress codes because honestly, I almost feel like wearing suits and, and having dress codes can be two different conversations, right? Because your your logic could say we're gonna wear polos and and look nice. And if that's what your lodge wants, that's that's totally that's fine, right? But I feel as though a lot of the objections to suits, um, to be frank with you, I think are bull crap. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Like you've already pointed out, you have numerous suits that are cheap. Um, when I was in college. I went to Goodwill. I, I didn't have money, right? I went to Goodwill, found a few nice suits, and they worked just fine. And no one knew where they came from. Yeah. It, um, as far as the time thing, really, when you have these discussions with people, and granted, it usually happens on, on Mesas of Texas, they, they find ways to kind of worm around your, your, your responses. Like, uh, there was a cover. It might have even been you having a conversation with somebody, but they were saying they didn't have that time. discussion in over a year. Okay, <laughs> but they I were saying behavior. <laughs> well, somebody else I don't remember, but one one man, one brother was saying, you know, he didn't have time to change right after lodge. I mean, right after work and go to lodge, and so responded, "Well, we have a closet in our lodge where we keep suits. Maybe we could try something like that." And then his response is like, well, it's just, it's just, you know, you know, it's not, not, convenient not or... it's not convenient or something. And, and, and it's like, no matter what you throw, just be honest. You just don't want to wear a suit. That's yeah. what it comes down to. You don't want to wear a suit and you're trying to justify it. And, you know, there's a whole generation of people that never wore a suit for work. They didn't feel the need for it. They, they did their job. They didn't go into management or whatever. So they didn't ever have to, mm-hmm. um, you know, straight out of college. I jumped immediately into management. I've done IT project management all of these years. And the moment that I started doing the IT project management was when my attire started to go downhill. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't have to dress up. I, I could show up in t-shirt and jeans and uh, polos and, you know, whatever, but it just didn't ever need to be done for work. Mm-hmm. So I looked forward to the opportunity to get back into suits. And that's what pre-masonry pre- actually brought back to me was my ability to get dressed up and, and look in the mirror and say, hey, that's, that's cool. That's not me looking like, a, um, you know, like I'm going to shop at the store. It's I'm doing something that's important, something that's special. Yeah. And, um, you know, you you can go down the rabbit hole with all the additional items that go with the suits, which people are starting to get into. You look at uh, Right Worshipful Billings, he's getting into selling the cufflinks and the uh, pocket watch chains with the fobs and everything. So that's a whole different level of stepping up your game mm-hmm. besides just wearing a suit or a vest or you know bow ties or ascots or getting into the cool stuff, bringing yeah. back the history that we had with our fraternity and, you know, it, it, I'll, I'll take it one step further. You know, it, I've, I've seen the discussions about people saying that the master's hat should be a Stetson, the exact quote Stetson. I see. That's a, that's a brand. That's not a style of hat. You're, you're talking about a cowboy hat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there are those that do that and that's what's expected but there there's a whole different line of hats that are also available you can get into the fedora the bowlers the port pies the uh derbies the whole line of hats that have the brim all mm-hmm. the way around that is completely acceptable and really and truly goes better with a suit looks and, and better with a suit really if you would and we're, we don't we're not going to go into detail on this but really even just to shape your head really kind of d- dictates what's a nice hat for you it does so uh, a stetson might look good on some brothers but not on everybody and a fedora this year in the east i have worn three different hats i i started with uh, dead man's top hat which looked kind of like the mad hatter <laughs> love the hat cool uh try to homburg which is what winston churchill wore 
didn't necessarily suit my face and body shape. So I moved into a bowler and the bowler is what I've used for the vast majority of my meetings. And nice. it, it looks really, really good with the suit and it, it suits my profile. So it's all Very cool. cool. Yeah. But before, before everyone, you know, all the keyboard warriors want to, uh, <laughs> want to, want to say that, you know, you and I are, are pushing for suits at every lodge or tuxedos. I'll go back to what I said earlier. I was raised in a rural lodge, right? I still live in, I mean, I live close to DFW, but for all intents and purposes, my area is rural still. You're, you're not going to push suits on everybody. No, it's, just, it's just not going to happen. I'll wear a suit whenever I can, but that's just me because I like to raise the bar. But I do think it's important that you have some kind of dress code, something that puts you guys on the level when you meet. And I mean, that could be, say, you know, we're going to wear blue jeans and polo shirts or khakis and, and, and a button up shirt or, or something like that. But there needs to be something, you know, you need to have some kind of expectation because at the end of the day, and I know I, I've, we've all heard it, you know, ad nauseum, the internal, not the external, but you don't want guys showing up in shorts and flip flops for a degree. No, you just, but at the same time, if somebody shows up to one of my meetings in shorts and flip flops, I'm thankful that they showed up to my meeting. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not going to turn them away. I'm not going to make them feel uncomfortable. I'm going to welcome them, welcome them as a brother mm -hmm. and, and treat them with brotherly love. That's, yeah. that's what we do. Um, and I, I don't think I've ever heard of a lodge kick up, you know, turn away a brother for, for dress. But I do think, let's be fair. If, if you're a lodge that only wears suits, it's really fair to let people know that's what's, that's what's expected. Mm -hmm. Because if I show up in shorts and a croc, you know, some crocs, and I'll walk in that door and everyone's dressed up, I'm going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. I, I, I frankly would turn around and walk around and walk out and leave. Yeah. I've, I've walked in lodges in my three piece suit and, um, and these are some of the more rural lodges and not had a single person greet me. They t-shirt and jeans, whatever. Mm -hmm. I go sit in a corner and wait for the meeting to start and hadn't been talked to even once. Mm. So it, it's, I felt the discrimination for wearing it instead of what we keep seeing happen online where people that want to dress down think they're going to be discriminated against. We, we don't do that. And what's odd about that and what you just described, I can't imagine a situation where if a brother came in in like shorts, we'll just keep using shorts like this. He came in in shorts and sat down. I can't imagine a situation where regardless of the dress code in that lodge, the brothers are going to come greet him and try to be friendly, or at least some of them. Right. Yeah. But I can't imagine a situation where you go to a rural lodge dressed like you're talking about and it's awkward. No one wants to talk to you. So I, I wasn't talked to until a group of, I think it was five DDGMs walked in the door. All of them were suited up. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them knew me. So they oh. sat, they sit around me at dinner and everybody's <laughs> looking at me going, who's this guy that we just ignored? Yeah. <laughs> but the, these concerns of discrimination are really flipped. Yeah. You know, it, and, but I don't know. It's the, the whole dress code thing. It's a, it's a sensitive topic and. And it's not I, a dress code. It's a, it's, it's not a code. We, we don't codify how people should dress other than the apron with the proper dimensions. Yeah. Other, other than that, it's, it's just social norms. What it comes to, I mean, what it really, what really strikes me is when you say that you can't really codify respect and that's going back to what you said some time ago, you know, if you look at the, if you look on the walls, you have past masters. These are people that, that built the communities, established the counties, in many cases, established the state we live in um, even further back we, you know, we have brothers that basically responsible for the foundation of our country yeah dress dress out of respect for them and nothing else exactly because when you look back at it if people are taking pictures or making paintings of our fraternity to show up in history books show up in books and uh, about masonry in general do we want to look like the ones from the past or do we want to look like we 
don't care. Yeah. Like we that just might, got that back from- been, That might've been harsh, but- well, we don't look like we just came back from a back, like a backyard barbecue or something. You know, we yeah. need a barbecue, you say. <laughs> Let's go back to the conversation about dues, particularly running, running Lodge like a business. This is something I feel strongly about. Me too. Because it, it's, it's, we're a volunteer organization, right? So you can come or go as you want, but when your lodge is, is has a hole in its bucket and you're losing money, right? You you you're not financially viable. There comes a time when you have to kind of switch your paradigm, kind of your how you're viewing your approach yeah. with with your lodge, because that too many lodges are working like that. Too many lodges are just shooting from the hip. And, you know, we'll, we'll cover the difference with fundraising, even though money is just bleeding out of the organization. Oh, yeah. So what are your thoughts on this? I personally think across the board, we need to consolidate a good chunk of our lodges. I think that people need to, um, you know, I saw a post today asking how many people are plural members and how many lodges they're a member of. I, I, Yes, I'm a member of three lodges plus TLR and Tranquility, but I, I personally think that plural memberships kind of need to go away. You need to be a member of one or two lodges. Grand Lodge should hit you for per capita once, mm-hmm. uh, not double dip and hit you two, three, four, 20 times, whatever, however many times you're pluraled. Um, hit for what they really want to hit you for. And the lodges need to charge enough money to perform, to function without having to hit their savings accounts. They, mm-hmm. they should be able to uh, run their budget without having to ask for handouts. Um, and you raise the dues so that you can give men the masonry that they deserve and want. You know, it's our, our, our our dues should go for bringing in Masonic scholars to educate us a couple of times a year. We should have that, you know, a rotating list of men that we want to come in and educate our lodge on uh, given topics. Mm -hmm. There, there, There are so many great wealths of knowledge around this country that would be willing to fly to, you know, to anywhere in Texas to, to give a lecture to our, our brethren. Yeah. And we need to charge accordingly. You know, you've, you've got what most lodges, 25% at tops as uh, active members. It's about right. So that other 75% are just dues payers, which means they're paying hundred, hundred fifty, three hundred and sixty-five 150, 365 dollars, whatever, just to carry a little card in their wallet. That means that they aren't getting the value out of masonry that they want mm-hmm. or they'd be there for the meetings. So charge more to everybody instead of just the 25% that are showing up for the meetings and give them what they want. Really our, our current due structures in most lodges are probably our biggest hurdle keeping us from revitalizing our lodges. Yes. Because if, if you, if you take a lodge, say mine, for example, uh, I won't name it, but we'll say it was built in the, in the sixties, right? It's an old lodge building at this point, you know, to, if someone was to get it to like, let's be honest, Hillcrest standard, you know, how that's looking, you so know, my lodge was built in the fifties. Oh, wow. So okay. The building was built in the fifties. So do you feel comfortable telling me how much it cost to the numbers I saw was 200 to 250 for the revamp for the full remodel. 200,000. Yeah. What you did yeah. then was, was huge. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was a lot of work then. It was a whole lot of work because you, you know, you had standard, like, I think it was center block walls that mm-hmm. were painted and those are all covered up with marble. Now you've got the wood floors, you've got the marble floors, you have a, a nicely appointed lodge. Yeah. It, wow. It's, the, the work's not cheap. The materials aren't cheap. And, um, and that's, that goes back to my, statement a little bit earlier about consolidation if you can get some lodges that are reasonably close to each other to consolidate 
Mm -hmm. can, uh, you can take the money from the facility that they, if the, either of them or any of them are willing to give up their current facility, you can sell that off with Grand Lodge's help mm -hmm. and funnel the money into the new lodge to do the revamp to create the building that you've dreamt of. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're taking an old building, and this is more for the audience because I know you're very aware of this, but if you're taking an old building and you want to revamp it, First of all, you got to get it up to standard. You know, that, that means that means fixing the years of neglect. It, you know, it goes towards maintenance and everything like that. And then you're looking at repainting, redoing the ceilings, probably changing the floors out. And, and what else? I mean, probably updating the kitchens, updating the furniture, kitchens, updating uh, any of the additional rooms. So you're not just going to revamp the lodge room. Mm -hmm. You're going to revamp the ante room. You're going to revamp the hallways. You're going to revamp the kitchen, the dining hall. You're going to build a library into it. Yeah. Um, there, there's a whole, a whole lot of different areas that you're going to need to improve. But you can't do any of that without money. Yeah. And that's, and, and so really you got options, right? You could do, you could do a merge, which will probably cover quite a bit if, you know, depending on the lodges. You could do a fundraiser, which let's be honest, is a bad idea, right? Because you should, in, in my opinion, you should never do a fundraiser to fix your building. Yeah. A, you're, you're effectively asking the public to pay for your private clubhouse. You're also doing twice the work because yeah. you're raising the money and then you're turning around and, and in most cases, you're, you're doing the actual work on the lodge too. Yeah. That's a good way to burn people out. It is. So the other alternative is the brothers fund it themselves. They pay for it. And, and that's, dues are their most reliable source of income for a lodge, right? If, if last year taught us anything, fundraisers aren't always reliable anyway. So it, it really needs to come down to us funding our own buildings. And if, and if your building's in need of an update, which let's be honest, a huge percentage of Texas lodges are because most of them were built within the time frame we're talking about. You know, we're still working out of 1950s to 1970s buildings. If we want to move forward, we need to revamp these things because these oh, yeah. buildings are falling down around us. You know, we, oh, yeah. I, I went to one that, first of all, when you go in the lodge room, the, the wall is covered in plaques. And what happened was uh, a brother bought everybody endowments and this was this was like 10 years this was before the minimums were out so this was when nothing was getting paid at all yeah yeah and so everyone's endowed they're not getting a penny for it and the building is falling down literally around them like you could you could look between the wall and the ceiling at some point and, and see the sky yep. <laughs> you know we we have to take better care of our buildings it's yeah. it's it's our baby it's it's what really separates us it's where we do our work yeah it has to be a nice place the the lodge that i was raised in um it was actually the former movie theater for the town of frisco cool and so during early 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 frisco times when it was the movie theater it caught on fire and it it burned and all that was left was an archway where the uh, ticket booth was so mm -hmm. they maintained that, added a, a rock facade to it, and then brickwork. Um, over the years, the mortar started to come loose, and the rockwork started to become a little bit unstable. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the projects was to remove the stonework and add brick into that area. So you know they they made it where it mimicked the other downtown area buildings while maintaining the archwork and mm -hmm. then maintained the brickwork. Then you look in the back of the wall, in the back wall of the building, and there were cracks in the mortar. Some moisture was getting into the building. Um, it, it just it needed some assistance. So they did stucco. So you get a little bit different appearance, but you're maintaining the building. You're fixing it, making it where it's not going to fall down around you mm -hmm. and uh, adding value back to the building and back to the community as a whole. That's, that's something a lot of brothers don't think of as well. I love it. The building falling down around you is decreasing the value of the city. It is 
it is low. It, it's an eyesore. It's, mm-hmm. You know, if you're not keeping it up, it's, it's, it's not value added. Yeah. If anything, it's a health hazard. There is that too. Yeah. I also want to look back, you know, you talked about the pool of memberships. If you want to raise your dues to $300 and you got members that are members of three or four lodges, the problem isn't that they don't see the value in the fraternity necessarily. The problem is they're already spending $400 or $500 to be in the fraternity. And so those pool memberships, from a per capita perspective, I'm sure it's nice, right? But for an individual perspective, from a actually from a from a large perspective, it's it's doing us more harm in the long run. It's a detriment to the lodge. Yeah. It, it's a detriment to the lodge, even if it's not quite a detriment to the grand lodge structure. Mm-hmm. But in on the grand scheme of things, it's a detriment to the grand lodge scheme because you're borrowing membership from another lodge to possibly make the lodge run if you're yeah. in multiple lines if you're trying to make multiple lodges run that probably shouldn't well if you have one guy one brother and he's a member of five lodges and he's paying per capita for every one of those if he passes away you're losing quite a bit so it's really exponential you know you're, you're getting more you're, you're tapping brothers for more per capita but when they pass away it's a bigger hit as well. It is. And, and, and this is my own opinion, but I, I really feel as though per capita is probably too low anyway. I feel, I feel as though Grand Lodge faces the same issue that individual lodges are and that Masons are, what's a nice way of putting it? We don't want to, we don't want to spend money on dues. Well, it, the last few years sitting in Grand Lodge and seeing all of the different uh, resolutions that are shot down that are related to raising the per capita for uh, fixing the building or helping out with different initiatives the Grand Lodge wants to implement. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the people will hear exactly what Grand Lodge wants to do with the money and why they want to raise the per capita and they shoot it down. Yeah. You know, they, they love the building in Waco. They love the idea that we have a physical building. Mm-hmm. They love the, uh, the trustees and what the trustees want to do, but they don't love it enough to fund it appropriately. Everyone wants to keep it, but nobody wants to pay for it. Yeah. And it's, and that's a, that's a detriment to our fraternity because we are not just individual lodges. We are individual lodges that float up to a grand lodge. Yeah. When you love something, you pay for it. Yeah. And it's really what it comes down to. And to be frank, we're cheap. We're just, mm-hmm. we're, we're cheapskates. Yeah. You know, we, we are, our degree fees are dirt cheap. Our dues are dirt cheap. Our per capita is really cheap. And we don't want to pay a dime more. But everybody wants to have that shirt or hat or toilet paper with a square and compasses on it. Yeah. They're willing Every, to pay for that. Everyone wants a Hillcrest Lodge, but they don't want Hillcrest Lodge dues. Our dues aren't that much. Oh, they're not? <laughs> no, they're not. What are they? 150 a year. Wow, that is really low. Yeah. I, I was talking with Kyle earlier this year, and I, I floated around the idea of doing a gradual increase to uh, match some of the other lodges in the area. Uh, I think Fort Worth is one of the ones that has a dollar a day, mm-hmm. which I, I personally don't think that that's out of line if you're going to bring in appropriate educational programs. Yeah. If, if you're going to add value, if you're going to do you know, the, the festive boards, if you're going to do the, the other events that call for additional fees, I, I think it's, it, it adds value to the lodge. Yeah. It's, it's really a two-edged sword. You, you have to present value to justify raising dues, but mm-hmm. you can't present value for free. And so you have to fund that. And so it's, 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 you want to pre- present that value so that when you talk about dues, you can say, look, this is what we're doing. And we want to in- either increase this or, or add this to it or, or continue it. So you have something to actually justify raising it, but it's rough. You know, it's, it is. it's, it's, you got to find that fine line where you can justify, you can find the value and justify raising it at the same time. The moment you make that proposal, it's, going to 
always be fought against mm -hmm. just because it, one, it's change two, it's money. Yeah. But what's really interesting, I think we know based on the conversation, I've never sat in Hillcrest Lodge, but I, I have seen enough of it. I know you have a quality lodge, but what's, what's interesting about this, knowing your dues, my lodge has higher dues than yours now at this point. But I feel as though the value Hillcrest is bringing justifies much higher than what you're... Uh, granted, I'm not a member. It's not probably my place. But just from the outside looking in, it seems like it justifies it. You know, you already have the value there. You know, you just got to pitch it. And that's, that's where Kyle and I were discussing earlier in the Masonic year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I thought we can't jump over a hundred percent increase. That's just not, that's not something that you're ever going to win. No, um, I know that. But, but a, gra <laughs> I a, a, that gradual, a gradual <laughs> increase over time, I, I don't think is out of line. I think, I think that's something that can actually pass and is reasonable. Yeah. You know, if you, if you ramp it up over a five-year period to get to the point that you want to be, that's, that's what needs to be done. Very cool. Yeah, I absolutely agree. The problem Again, is, the problem is it's like such a, a battle. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta be smart about it, right? Yeah, you know, most lodges they they haven't even thought about their dues in so many years, so they don't they don't look at the uh, the, the interest rates going up, API, none of it. They they don't think about it, and you know, as as things are more expensive in society, you've got to think of that because all of you know our electricity, our gas, our insurance, all of that increases every single year. It, it increases with the uh, with the interest rates. We never want to be the bad guy. No. And that's, you know, when you when you start, I just, this is close to my heart because I, I was the bad guy. I brought this up last year. And uh, it's, no one wants to be that guy. No one wants no. to just stir the pot, raise contention. Well, well, not in the lodge anyway. You know, maybe, maybe <laughs> online, right? We, we know each other too well, right? But, uh, but, yeah, <laughs> I, I've never stirred any pots. Oh, no, definitely not, definitely. But within the lodge, you know, you, you really want to maintain that peace and harmony. And boy, I tell you, you start bringing up dues. And that's why, you know, I get that you want to do it incrementally, like yeah. a certain amount of time, you know, but man, it just makes people so mad. And, and that's why you want to do it all at once. Just get it uh, out of the way. Another option is to add it to the bylaws and have it in the bylaws that it's going to increase X amount every single year, just so that it can keep up with the per capita and the uh, other increases that need to happen. Yeah, that is a good option. How do you feel about endowments? Why, as long as we're talking about money, as long as we're making people mad, let's just make everybody angry at once. Endowments. Um, I'm endowed at two of my three lodges, and I think they are truly a detriment to the lodge. While the, while the person is living, it's a detriment to the lodge because you're never going to get the amount back that they would have paid in dues. Um, it, it's, it's just going to be a drain on the system until the moment that they die and then the lodge gets free money from that point forward. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it might have been a good idea, but there needed to be some minimums instituted in the very beginning and it needed to be, you know, 30 times the annual dues so yeah. that it could actually give a decent return to the lodge, which it's not seen right now. What's, what's interesting about that is when this, when the program originally granted, I wasn't there. Right. But I've talked to the others that were, that were in the know when this program was originally instituted in the early 80s. The minimum, the $500 minimum, was based off um, what the average dues were across the state at that time. So about $25 times 20. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they, they understood, you know, you had to have some kind of multiplier based off some kind of um, basis. But that was in the early 80s, right? And you, I mean, in our last, our last conversation, you talked about how we haven't kept up with inflation. Yeah. We're talking about a minimal amount that was set in 1980, so 40 years ago. And it was almost 35 years before they came up with something different. Yes. And so it hasn't increased in all that time. And yeah, 
it, but the thing is in the early 80s if if $500 was 20 times your dues that was a good amount of money right and so the endowment served its purpose it wasn't for everybody it was it was either in like memory of somebody or it was a gift mm -hmm. to the lodge and it was probably a big deal because it, it was significant amount if it was if it was 20 times average dues today it still serve its purpose and and it wouldn't be the amount that would give you a return equal to your dues but it'd be a high enough amount that it would still be a significant a, a big enough deal to do it and frankly it would be high enough to discourage people from casually doing it it was that's the a, biggest problem yeah it wouldn't be a loss to the lodge every single time somebody does it yeah, that's right it wouldn't be a loss every time as it is right now, the average dues is hundred dollars across the state, most likely. And that's just from, I mean, I think that's reasonable. That's from my experience. And if the, and most lodgers are still sitting at that minimum. So as a, as, as a new 18 year old bright eyed Mason, why wouldn't you just pay five years up front and just be done with it? Yeah. And, and, and you just shut your lodge in the foot right there off the bat. And no one knows any different. No one knows any better. That's what's bad and about any it. anybody that talks bad to the person that did it and says that they need to pay, you know, per capita or whatever back. You can make that recommendation to somebody, but the agreement that the person came up were presented with was the moment you pay this endowment, you don't ever owe dues again. Well, that's what the law book says. Yeah, I mean, it even spells it out. You know, you're you're exempt from paying dues for the rest of your life and i've had people say well just require them to go ahead and pay per capita that's nice but you you, you can't there's no law does not allow for that I mean, yeah you can you can't suspend someone to, that's endowed right you can ask them to but you can't demand that they do that you can ask but exactly you can't demand it so it really it really puts you in a tough spot mm -hmm. so i know i know we're getting late i don't want to take a whole lot more of your time uh, I have one one more thing for you, and you probably don't feel very strongly about this. So, you know, <laughs> skulls and Freemasonry, yes or no? There are no skulls and Freemasonry, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what the hashtag says. So I'm just going by what I see now. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the last time that I actually posted one Masonically. It's been a little while, I believe. But raises a, raises a, I guess. It, I guess it has been a while, and I guess you're the one that's been post that was posting it the most, because if you haven't posted in a while, I haven't really seen anything in a while either on it. I, I, I've gone probably a little over a year since mm -hmm. the last time I did it. Um, caught a little flack for it, but I was specifically posting images that were either historic with, uh, you know, trestle boards or uh, carvings or even modern art from modern Masonic artists. Mm -hmm. uh, Jens Rausch, Harry Rusimov, uh, both of them feature the uh, skull uh, prominently in lots of their modern Masonic art. Yeah. Um, Ronnie Zulu, um, Josh Hall, other modern Masonic artists, they, mm -hmm. they do it as well. And I, I, I like the symbolism that they bring to the fraternity. They've looked through the art books of the past, the Masonic art from the past, and they bring their own modern take on it. And they didn't shy away from the skull. They didn't shy away from the uh, symbols of our degrees. And um, yeah, it's, if anybody knows me, they know that the symbolism is where my heart lies. That's, um, that's what I tend to focus on. You know, historically, we live in very unique times because until very recently, death was a very, it was something you lived with, you know, mm -hmm. daily. You saw it almost daily. Um, and so it was always on our minds. And so it wasn't, this idea of, of the skull symbol wasn't so scary. And I think it's unfortunate that we're not, that we're not willing to uh, look guys, whoever's listening, I, I hate to, I, I know you, 
might not know this, so I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're going to die one day. I'm sorry. I know this might be a shock. Pause the video if you need to get some whiskey, you know, have a, have a few moments of reflection, but we're all going to turn. Yeah. We will turn back into the stardust that we came from. Yes. Yes. And the sooner you acknowledge that and prepare for that, the happier you'll be. And the more, and frankly, the more, and it sounds crazy. Like as soon as to say that when you acknowledge you're going to die one day, the happier you'll be, but it it really kind of gives you time to, to be at peace with that. I think it it, it lets you live for the now. It lets you live for the now. Exactly. It lets you live for the now and for the future because you know, you're, you're trying to make a good world for those that come after you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and and hopefully it will allow us to pass into the next world a little more gracefully than, than, than kicking and screaming, you know, and, and those symbols were historically used. It wasn't just the biker gangs, the hell's angels, the banditos, the other, um, organizations that were frowned upon by the golden generation. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's when that symbol started to fall out and the goat replaced it. So mm. we, we went from having the goat and coffins to having a, a or I'm sorry, having skulls and coffins to having a goat. Seriously, that's really the path we want to go down. I think a goat looks more culty than a skull and coffin. Well, yeah. But it's, um, I, I just feel, I feel like there's two mindsets and we've already kind of talked about one of them. It's the, it's the mindset that that's scared of it, that wants to kind of sweep it under the rug. Well, and, they fear and, death. They fear that uh, as they get older, they, they see that that's their future. And well, they might not have lived the best life. They might not have lived the uh, life that they wanted to. So yeah. they're regretting things. Absolutely. So anytime they, they are presented with that image, they're presented with their failures, with their uh, inadequacies. But that's and, what it's supposed to do. It is. But a lot of us just aren't, I guess we're not comfortable with that self-reflection. But you got the, you got the, other, you got the other group, you know, that was for a while. We we're, you know, it was, it was being posted a lot. And a lot of people were, not a lot, but there was a handful of guys, myself included, that were being very supportive of that. And I can't speak for everybody, but, but to me, it, it, wasn't about, it wasn't about pissing people off. It was never about making people angry. Never. It was about, look at this. I, I really just hate it when things are swept under the rug. I, I, I don't like things being overlooked because they're, they're scary or make us uncomfortable. We need to acknowledge this. To me, it's probably the most powerful symbol of Freemasonry. And it was, pro- it, was, it was a prominent symbol of Freemasonry, probably for that reason until pretty recently. Well, I mean, the moment, the moment that you look at George Washington's apron from uh, Marquette de Lafayette, it has the skull and crossbones right in the middle of the square and compasses. I mean, how, how much more prominent do you get than the first president's apron? It's a, it's a, I'd say well known, but it, it might not be as well known as you would think. But go to Grand Lodge of Texas, yeah. go stand right there in front of the door. It's You've right got there. The seal. You've got the seal. And, yeah. Um, you know, there will people that will be people that say no skulls and masonry. And then you point at that and they're like, oh, well, that's not a Grand Lodge anymore. It's like, come on, guys. Yeah, it doesn't apply. You, now. you can't have it both ways. <laughs> that's why it's not a Grand Lodge anymore. They had a skull in their seal. So that's what yeah. that's what drove it to extinction, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, Stephen, it's been a great conversation. I mean, I I knew it was going to be good. I have truly enjoyed it. Do you have any last minute comments or anything that you'd like to toss in there? No, thanks for having me though. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure on my end as well. And hopefully we can have this conversation again sometime uh, in person. Of course. You know, I'm always game for that. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again, Stephen. And I hope to sit in with you again soon, brother. Yes, sir. See you soon. Brother Stephen Berryman, everybody. What a fantastic interview. And I knew when I invited him and he accepted that this was going to be a very good conversation. Steven and I probably could have talked for another hour or two. So I'd love to have him back sometime. We talked about so much stuff and we didn't get to go into uh, as much detail on some things as I would have liked. I took lots of notes during our conversation. And while we touched on a lot of things, we didn't go deep into a lot of things. And I know that he and I could. We talked about lodge merging. Um, this is something very important. 
lodges multiplied as our fraternity gained large amounts of members. And regardless of how you feel about the decline in numbers, the fact remains that we have many buildings that were built in order to accommodate the growing membership. And without those members there to support that many lodges, your options are very slim. You can raise your dues. You can find just a really great fundraiser, I guess, and that'd be all you focus on, which isn't Freemasonry, in my opinion. Or you can merge with another lodge, or you can turn in your charter. But the fact remains, if you don't have the brothers available, to put in the work or otherwise keep your lodge financially viable or have enough members to actually even fill positions, then your options are, like I said, they're limited and you need to consider merging or I, I, I don't know why a lodge would demise unless it had to, frankly, if merging is an option. And it isn't a sign of failure. It doesn't mean that your lodge has failed. It doesn't mean that your lodge history is gone for forever. What it means is that for whatever reason, it made sense for that lodge to join another lodge and your history becomes their history and vice versa. We also talked about young men in Freemasonry, how to attract them and the importance of creating an online presence. I linked these three together because I feel as though they're all very closely related. I've said it before, but for those of you who have not listened to me or if you're new to my channel, I don't think that Freemasonry is going to remain an old man's organization for, for much longer. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just if you look at the age demographics, it's uh, very dominantly older brethren. And what's happening as younger men continue to express interest in the fraternity as the older generations um, become inactive or unfortunately pass away, you're going to see a higher proportion of younger men joining. But really the question, at least in my mind, isn't how can we attract young men? The problem is how can we retain them? We see polite discussions on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, you'll see my air quotes I just made, but we see polite discussions on Facebook uh, asking why young men won't join or why they don't stay around. And it's usually chalked up to them being lazy or it being too much work or them not having time. Um, really a bunch of excuses that we make for ourselves why they're not interested in participating or sometimes even joining in the first place. So my argument is that young men are attracted to the fraternity because it is hard to get into. We live in an age of convenience. It is assumed that everything needs to be quick and easy and convenient. And I think this goes against human nature. Now, I'm not saying that I'm ready to sell all my luxuries and go live you know, on an island somewhere. Conveniences are nice, but I think part of us as humans still strive for something that is not convenient. We live in an age unlike any other known of in the past. Therefore, this is new territory for humans. However, we are still genetically programmed, if you want to put it that way, to, to strive for things that are hard, that don't come easy, that test our limits and encourage us to grow. And Freemasonry offers all these things. And these are not things you're going to find in a one-day class. I'm sorry. They're not things you're going to find by throwing out the catechism or doing away the investigation process or keeping dues cheap or watering down Masonic education or pretending like the skull is not a symbol in Freemasonry or discouraging things like chambers of reflection because they're scary and might run people off. These are the things people are coming for. You may scare off one or two, certainly. But when a degree is supposed to be a transformative, initiatic experience, anything you can implement 
that will empower that degree to have a stronger impact on the candidate within reason should be considered. I think an online presence is important. I don't necessarily know that I agree with a website because I can Google any lodge and I can find where they're at and when they meet. A website might be useful if you have something like Waco 92's website, which I encourage you to go check it out. I'm not gonna provide the link, just Google Waco Lodge number 92 on, and you'll find their website. But they have quite a bit of history uh, from Waco and surrounding areas, which is interesting. It's nice to have that all in one place. But unless you have a brother that is a very dedicated historian and wants to contribute to a website to keep it interesting, most lodges don't have more information than that that they really need to provide. Um, a Facebook page is excellent. I recommend every lodge should have a Facebook page that you can post things to regularly. And anytime a lodge does something, there should be some kind of content posted. A huge aspect of the success of any organization depends on its ability to remain in front of people. Social media is probably the best way. And frankly, it's free. You can remain in front of people for free as long as there's someone that's willing to post something on a regular basis. So I would encourage a Facebook page at a minimum. Explore social media and find what else works best for your lodge. But there are options out there. And in this day and age, there's really no reason why you would not. We also discussed the importance of having nice buildings. And I'm not suggesting that every Masonic Lodge should look like a palace or anything like that. And you definitely don't want to break the bank to try to make it look nice. But if your lodge is giving away thousands of dollars in scholarships while the ceiling's falling in, then you need to reevaluate your priorities. My point is, if your lodge is falling apart and a potential candidate comes in those doors, or if it's really bad and you can see it from the, from the street, he's not going to join. Dying organizations have crumbling buildings. If you see a building falling apart, it says a lot about the organization. Why on earth would anybody join that? And I know these things cost money, but if your lodge is doing fundraisers, maybe redirect that money to make your lodge a nice building. Or here's a radical idea for you. Everybody shares the burden and you raise the dues. We also talked about dress codes, which is something that I haven't addressed directly, though it has been coming up quite a bit in my recent conversations with brothers. I feel as though every lodge should have a dress code. And personally, I feel as though that dress code should be a suit of some sort. But I'm also realistic enough to know that a suit dress code simply won't fly in every lodge. But there's not an excuse not to have some kind of a dress code, be it a polo, or a button down shirt, or even if you want your dress code to be overalls, you know your lodge better than I ever could. And it's not my place to tell you what you should wear in your lodge. But as Masons, we should strive to meet on the level as many ways as we can and show respect for our organization. If you feel as though a, a polo and some khaki pants are, are respectful, then do a lodge polo. Everyone wears the polo on lodge night or for degrees. And you just wear some nice pants and some shoes. There's nothing wrong with that. Likewise, if you're a very rural lodge and everyone wants to wear a button down shirt with overalls, again, not my cup of tea, but if that's what your lodge wants to do, be the lodge that wears overalls. That's okay. There's lodges that wear tuxedos. Why can't there be lodges that wear overalls? If you feel that is respectful of the fraternity. I'm a huge advocate of raising the bar. And if your lodge has no dress code at all, any dress code is raising the bar. And if you create a dress code based on your local lodge and your local community and your lodge's culture, then the internal versus the external argument has no merit in that case. This is not being elitist. You're choosing an approach that should be reasonably achievable by every member of the lodge. The next topic we discussed was running your lodge like a business. Listen, guys, brothers, friends, the way most 
lodges run their business would be a would be a financial disaster for an actual company. There's two sides to how you have to run every Masonic lodge. One side is you're going to run it like a fraternity, and specifically a Masonic fraternity and everything that entails. But on the other hand, the side that's often neglected is you also have to run it like a business. You have to make smart financial decisions. You have to look at data and be willing to look at it logically, not emotionally. Emotion belongs over here on the other side, the fraternal side. But running it like a business, you can't have the emotion in there. You have to, you have to be willing to make the hard decisions so that your children and your grandchildren have a local Masonic lodge that they can attend. It's all, you have to separate the emotion from the logic and you have to take them both seriously. Most lodges are just over here. Most lodges are all emotion. You have to have both sides to be a healthy lodge. They complement each other. But if you're all the way over here, your lodge is gonna die because it's not gonna make smart decisions. It's making emotional decisions. And if you're all the way over here, it's all business. There's no fraternity to it. You have to have both. It takes both kinds of brothers, but most lodges have nothing over here. We also talked about endowments. I'm not going to hit on this very hard. <laughs> I could. I, I, think, uh, I think I have a video about this out there. I think it's still out there. Listen, if you're in Texas, guys, look at the endowments in the law book. I think it's 318A. I might be wrong, but it's in the ballpark of that area. Look at the endowments, educate yourself, read about it, understand how they work, and then do the math. I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say what you should do or what you should raise it to in your lodge. Do the math and figure it out yourself. And if you're not great at math, you have someone in your lodge that is. Just look at it. I'll promise you, you're probably gonna be surprised. You need to make changes. We'll leave it at that. What they what they are, it's up to you. We also talk about skulls and Freemasonry, and this is something I enjoy because I have a real issue, and I don't know why, but it, it drives me crazy when we try to sweep things under the rug, and the skull is a symbol that has been swept under the rug. I think I know why. Skulls are scary. Memento Mori is, encourages us to reflect on our own mortality. And there are probably many men that would not like to reflect on the mortality. Uh, going back to what I said earlier about the older brethren, again, not being negative, but some of them, that's something they have to reflect on very soon. But the fact is it can come for any of us. It's, it's a very important symbol. And I think that ignoring it because it's scary, uh, it makes us uncomfortable, and we're afraid that it might scare away new members. That's, that's not a good reason to sweep it under the rug. And in fact, if we're afraid something's going to scare away somebody, that's okay. You have to know what you're about as an organization. And you have to have standards. Your standards have to be up here. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, my hand's up high. You have to have high standards. And the expectation is that we take good men and make them better. How? Because they come up to meet our standards. And they maintain that. And if they can't do that, that's, that's a, I mean, that's, that's fine. It just means that we don't get everybody, but they still have options as, as men to better themselves. They're just not meeting that high bar that we set for Freemasons. Now, instead, what we try to do is we, we, we lower our standards to meet them where they're at. They need to meet us where we're at. But what we've done, just repeat, is we're trying to meet them where they're at. We're taking out things that are, that are scary, quote unquote, but we're also doing, like I said earlier, and this isn't really a problem in Texas, but I have seen in other states where we're trying to meet them where they're at, which is make things quick and easy and cheap. And what's interesting about that is, is this really where they're at? That goes back to what I was saying earlier. See, I think, and I guess we'll tie this back to what I was saying earlier about young men. 
is we perceive them to be down low as far as standards go. So we're trying to lower those standards to meet them where they're at. Where we're perceiving that mostly based off assumptions. But what if they are up here and they're not attracted to us because we're down here? Would anybody with really high standards be attracted to something with low standards? Absolutely not. So I'm gonna leave you at that guys. I know we started talking about skulls and we started talking about standards at that point, but we have to keep raising the bar. And the problem with raising the, with lowering the bar is once it's low, it's hard to raise back up. We have to keep that bar high. People need to meet us at our standards. We don't meet them at theirs. But we're trying to take good men and make them better, but we're meeting them where they're already at. How does that cause them to improve? Is it making them improve or is it making us worse for it? Finally, before I sign out for, for the episode, and I'll be quick about this, if you haven't checked out my Patreon or considered buying me a coffee, please do. Every contribution helps, makes this a better podcast, a better YouTube channel, a better blog. That's all I got, brothers. I'll see you in the next video. I got someone great lined up and I'm looking forward to that interview. See you then.